Welcome back to the Sip and Feast podcast. Today we're talking steak pizzaiola. We're discussing the intricacies of this dish, the history of the dish, uh, what it means to us, what it means to you, Tower, uh, what it means if you grew up in the New York, New Jersey area, you probably know this dish, your mother, your Nona, your friends, your uncle, somebody probably made it for you. Somebody probably said they make a mean steak pizzaiola. Conversely, if you grew up in an area outside of this little pocket of America, you might not have heard of this dish. How do I know that? Well, we just put up the recipe on the main channel, and it's got about, I don't know, it has over 100,000 views, which is which is a good amount to, like a good sample size. And there were probably, Tower, I would say, 20, 30, maybe 50 comments that said they never heard of the dish, right? Mm-hmm. That's my non-scientific way of knowing that it might not be too known outside of this area. And that's why I want to share it with you today and let you know how good it is and how delicious it can be. If you're a fan of Everybody Loves Raymond, then you have heard of this dish because I believe, and I never really watched the show, Tower, I believe Ray used to say that his mother made the best steak, steak pizza. I think that's the story behind it. Yeah, you don't you she, don't know either, right? You don't watch the show either. I watched, you know, episodes here and there of it. Your parents are huge fans of it. Maybe we should have asked them what they thought of the steak pizzaiola references in the show. But no, my understanding is that Dar, um, Marie Barone, Dars Roberts' character, made like the best ste- steak pizzaiola. Well, I don't know if my version is going to be as good as Marie's, but we're going to talk about the difference between how it's done in a household and how it's done in a restaurant. And we're going to bring a little bit of the history of this dish, which from my understanding isn't too popular in Italy either, right? There wasn't a whole lot of information about where it originated, mainly just theories. Before Tara gives the backstory, I will just tell you simply, it goes by carne alla pizzaiola, bistecca a la pizzaiola, and basically, Tara, what does pizza, a la pizzaiola mean? So pizzaiola translates, it's an, it's an Italian word, translate it into English, it means pizza chef or pizza maker. And the dish usually refers to meat that's cooked in a pizza maker style. So what exactly does that mean? It's usually a tough cut of beef, right? That's braised in a tomato sauce with oregano. I think it's the oregano with the tomatoes that make it the pizza, that give it the pizza maker name. Am I right about that? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and there's usually some sort of uh, vegetable or that that goes along with that. Like I know our recipe includes peppers and mushrooms, onions. Oh, you found out that there is a vegetable always included in it? No, I'm just saying all the versions that I've had of the yeah. dish include I've never had it with just beef and tomato sauce. I think it I think really it probably is often done just with beef and tomato sauce. I wasn't sure because I always make it with mushrooms or peppers. Mm-hmm. Uh it we'll, we'll we'll talk more about in a second the different variations for it. And before Tower goes on here, I just I don't think I'm selling I didn't I don't think I I'm not selling enough. I didn't sell it all to you how good this dish is. It's it's a super flavorful dish. It's from the way that, now, I'm, again, I'm talking about one of the versions. It's the way the meat combines with the tomatoes and the cooking process that flavors the sauce. It makes it very, it's a very hearty dish. And the type of cut of beef too that I typically use and many others use makes it even heartier. It's a winter dish for me, a fall and winter dish. I wouldn't really want to eat this during the spring and summer, though I do enjoy plenty of steak during the spring and summer, this this dish is almost heavier than your typical, just a regular steak. It's almost like a beef stew. Yeah. But just with tomatoes and, and not with a, a broth. Really. And many people, when we made when we did the video, a lot of the people didn't know what it was, but then other ones were saying, who still didn't know what it was, they were like, this is a dish called Swiss steak. Yes, that's right. Those yeah. were a lot of comments. So there was yeah. a lot of comparison to that mm-hmm. as well. But I'll let Tara go on uh, about more info about it and the backstory. Okay, so like we said before, there wasn't a whole lot of information on Steak Pizzaiola. I tried to do as much research as I could, but what I did find was that 
Some theories say it originated in Naples. Others say it originated in Sicily. And there's one story that said this was something that a pizza maker would make for themselves while they were tending to the pizza for their customers. So I guess it was like something they would just almost set and forget while they were doing other things. But again, the information that was out there was very limited, especially compared to some of the other dishes that we've spoken about, like pasta fazool. Uh, there was a, a lot more historical information there. That's interesting because this dish is, it's a very popular dish here. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, maybe that makes sense because it's Neapolitan or Sicilian. So my thought was that since I wasn't able to gain a whole lot of insight onto the steak, the history of steak pizza Iola, I thought maybe we could just share our own history. My experience with the dish is from the way my mother and my grandmother made it. And I, oh, it's, this is a, this is another one of the dishes that I had a lot growing up. Now, it's funny, the, a cut of chuck, which is what my mother used, and she would use chuck steaks that were with the bone, which are harder to find now, definitely harder to find here in the places that we frequent. But she would get these very thin steaks, and these steaks were cut specifically on the band, so I have how a butcher does it, into about a half inch thick. So they had the bone in them, and then the meat was a half inch thick. So they were like perfect in that sense, maybe three quarter inch thick, that it, it, essentially this would make you not have to do a three hour brace. Because if you ever made a pot roast with a full chuck steak, you know, you're looking at a three hour, it could be up to four hour braising time versus if you cut the steaks, the, that whole chuck steak very into very thin pieces, you'll accelerate the, the cooking time. But that's how my mother made it. She made it with that type of cut of beef always and that's how, also how my gra grandmother made it. And then it was really simple. My, my mother wouldn't even put mushrooms or peppers, which is what I do now. She would just, just do tomatoes, plum tomatoes, a lot of garlic. And honestly, I don't even think she finished it with any herbs or, or anything. I don't think she used white wine. I think it was really the essence of the dish was that tomato, yeah. the garlic, and we would serve it. You would serve it with cheese on top, you know, besides the oregano. You would serve it with cheese on top at the end, which is, yeah, what you would kind of do with most dishes. Did she serve it with rice or pasta or how I did always, she serve I it? I always remember white rice yeah. being, being what it was served with. I, I remember a lot of dishes that she would do, but it was my, gran my grandmother more, I think, that baked rice dish that we did mm. a few months ago, uh, Riso Al Forno, which is a delicious dish. That kind of gives me a little bit of... I guess a similarity because she would bake it with the red sauce and the cheese. And mm -hmm. it was also the red sauce and, and the cheese for the steak pizza. Iola. I don't have too much of a history with steak pizza Iola because I did not grow up eating it. So did you even hear about it when you like, when did you hear about it? I honestly don't remember, but I feel like the first time I probably heard about it was from you, right? Because you would always talk about the different food that, that your mom or your grandma had, had cooked for you. And I know that was, one of the one of the meals that was in your like week was it a weekly rotation that no, she would it, make it or it, was it, it like a monthly? It wasn't weekly. It was it would definitely it was definitely monthly. Okay. Definitely had it twelve times a year, but <laughs> probably probably more. Yeah, I, I mean, I I joked in the past. My my mother didn't have three hundred dishes, mm -hmm. and I don't know. I don't think your mother or grandmother did either. <laughs> Tell maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they did, but. I, no, I mean that 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 wasn't the case for for, for, for well, not not the way I grew up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the first time I actually had steak pizzaiola was when you and I had gone out to dinner to, and we probably have spoken about this place a few times. It was uh, a little restaurant that was right off the Long Island Expressway in Hop Hog. It was called La Strada. The restaurant that's in its spot now is Piccola Bussola, which is a good restaurant. But uh, La Strada was, was one of the places we frequented, right? And when I had it, I believe they used a porterhouse. And it was, was, it was a dish for the two of us to share. It wasn't just like a standalone dish. The way you experienced it, mm -hmm. that will be the way you 95% of the time, you will have experienced it if you only know it from a restaurant. Mm -hmm. 
This is a common thing amongst a lot of these dishes. Mm -hmm. They get changed a lot when they make it into the restaurant. The way I had it, I don't remember if they had, I don't think they had peppers in the sauce. I just remember there being a lot of mushrooms and a lot of garlic. Yeah. And I remember really, really enjoying the dish. It was probably one of the first real, like really beefy dishes yeah. I had eaten because <laughs> up until I met you, I hadn't consumed a whole lot of, a lot of red meat. Yeah. No. Yeah. I remember, I remember when you, know, before you had like steak or anything. It seems that there are two ways to make this dish. One would be a quick way and then the other would be a slower way. The quick way being probably made with a leaner cut of beef, whereas the long way would be more of like a braise. So can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and honestly, there's probably three ways because so you, if you go into, and you can go into places here, you can go into specialty stores or supermarkets even, a lot of times they'll have like braising meat for sliced very thin for for like steak pizza all they'll they'll have as i said before the thin cut chuck steaks and then you can do it then much quicker even though it essentially is a braise then they'll have the thicker ones which are going to take you longer they could take upwards of 2 hours when i just made it recently it took two and a half hours roughly in the video because those were those steaks were huge. Mm -hmm. And then there's the, the fancy way. So I will just address, I want to talk about the fancy way. The There's a video from, it's like Rayo's from maybe 10 years ago. The the chef there, he was on like uh, Good Morning America or something. I don't know. I, I forget. I've, I've long forgot where, where it was, but it was on, he was on like local TV. Mm-hmm. I think he might've been on Elvis in the Elvis, you know what? He probably was on Elvis Duran because that's, aren't Elvis Duran always like pushing the sauce all the time? I believe Rayo sponsors yeah. the Elvis Duran in the morning. <laughs> yeah, so maybe that's where it was. And I think he made steak pizzaiola for the crew there. And it was like six in the morning or whatever, but there, <laughs> he had uh, two huge dry aged ribeyes that he made it with. And what he did, he started the sauce. I, I believe he made it the same way I make it. I think he did use peppers and mushrooms. And then he made the quick sauce like with the hand squeezed plum tomatoes. And then the sauce was done. So essentially a flash sauce, like 10 minutes. I think he grilled, I think they were outside. He grilled the steaks to medium rare, sliced the steaks, and then just put them in that sauce for like a minute. So mm -hmm. as not to overcook the steak, spooned it over, finished maybe with some herbs. Done. Now this is this is the the way that Tara was describing uh, at La Strada that we went to as well, and this is the right. way you will get it ninety five percent of the time in most restaurants. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a good thing for restaurants to serve because it's very easy for them to make. They can they have the grill just the grill person in the restaurant just do a steak. Mm -hmm. The sauce is already there. You're just throwing it together. Boom, served. And not that a braised dish is hard for a restaurant to make, but that means they have to make them ahead of time, and right. then when they run out. They run out. You're mm -hmm. never going to run out of the other way because you could just, you know, even if you run out of ribeyes or then you could just go back to the customer and be like, well, I only have porterhouse now. We only mm -hmm. have New York strips. Yeah. I mean, it even works really well with flank steak, mm -hmm. skirt steak. There's a variety of ways to make it. So, I mean, and they both have very, the outcome for both of these dishes is extremely different tasting. Yeah. I was going to just ask because, so one of the criticisms that James had in the pizza the video, tester. the taste tester. Who's our son? Little James, yes. Yeah. He, I mean, the people who listen to the podcast, it's, is it possible that they don't know the, the it's, YouTube it's, channel? So it is. It's, yeah. it's possible. So James is our son. He has been the taste tester on the main channel for quite some time right now. He'll usually take a, a few bites of the food at the end and, and give it a rating on a scale from one to 10. So for, and he'll usually criticize or, you know, say what it is that he likes about it or doesn't like. So he enjoyed the steak pizzaiolo, but the one thing that he was critical of was that it was too beefy for him. It just tasted too, sh the beef flavor was too much. First of all, if you like a beefy flavor, maybe you do want to cook it the long way, but if you are not into that whole beefiness, maybe the way that you'd want to eat it is the quick way. So yeah, because what happens is, and again, it got lost, I think, on some people. They were like, well, how could it be any more beefy? Well, the reason is, is first of all, I used a little bit of beef stock too, but the beef itself, when you're braising in that sauce for two hours, it changes the sauce from 
a bright sauce mm -hmm. to it's like a Sunday sauce. To like a concentrated yeah, like a Sunday sauce. Yeah, like a brick red. Yeah. Instead of like a bright red marinara. So very different. And I, often I do like it when the s tomatoes are very fresh. I do actually a sausage style, like a s sausage stuffed mushrooms. And then the, t the tomatoes are like chunks, really big pieces. Mm -hmm. They're only cooked for like 20 minutes. So speaking of seasons, you mentioned that you feel like this is more of a fall or winter dish. Perhaps your spring or summer version of the pizza aisle could just be a grilled steak yeah. with some of the the sauce quickly or, yeah. done on the side because then it's a little bit lighter. Or you can braise the dish, the beef, in other liquid. Remove the braised tender cut of beef, then put your the fresh, fresh tomatoes sauce. on and cook it for 10 minutes in the oven. Yeah, you could so do that, that. that's a way to do it. Because a lot of times when you really think about like pizza maker, you know, you're a pizza aiolo, you know, mm -hmm. in Italy, it's pizza sauce is always, almost always is not cooked. So you are putting that not cooked tomatoes mm -hmm. in there at the end. Yeah. The I only, like it both ways. Yeah. I, I could see it being good either way. Yeah. That's a big distinction. But then there's the other version, which I guess is the way, you know, that you were going to speak about. Okay. So the slow method of making this dish uh, is is basically how how you made it yeah. in the video. And I was able to find a little bit of information about this method. This, I'm gonna actually read something directly. It's from uh, Frank Fariello, who runs the site Memory D Angelina. And we've spoken about that site a few times. He's got a lot of good traditional- Excellent information on his site. Uh, I, I actually use it as a reference. So yeah, we're Tar Tara's going to quote him directly here. Yeah, so this is from his site. His uh, I think he calls it a la pizzaiola on his website. And it says, the original recipe used a rather tougher cut of beef cooked slowly. According to the authoritative Jean Carola Francesconi, author of the classic La Cucina Napolitana, the typical cut is called the colarda, which is taken from the rear leg of the steer. This is a cut that is not often found even in other parts of Italy. In other places, the costata, which is the rib or noce, a filet taken from the inner thigh are used. In the US, I'd use the kind of cut you'd use for a pot roast, like a bottom round. Yeah. So that's basically just a little bit of the history on what would have been used in Italy. But again, like he said, that part, the colarda, isn't really found, I guess, outside of Naples. That's a little bit about the cut of meat that would be for the slow method. We used, like you said, the chuck steaks, right? That's what your mom, your mom used to use the bone in chuck steaks, but if Which somebody, are hard to find now yeah. in the supermarkets. So if somebody can't find the chuck steaks that are already sliced, could they just buy a chuck roast and slice, slice it themselves? Or should they ask their butcher maybe to slice it I to would, the thickness they yeah. want? If you have access, if the butcher will do it for you. I would definitely go that way because it will be fairly hard for you to get even slices. Now, that being said, if you don't, you could just pound them out roughly to the same size. Mm -hmm. When they slice them with the bone, at that point, you don't really want to pound them out because your bone is going to be thicker than the meat. Also, you risk hitting the bone and potentially Explosion. getting a fragment or something like that. I would just pound them without the bone mm -hmm. or get thin ones with the bone. Yeah. Like how thin? Like a like a half, a quarter inch? They were about a half. No, they were about, the ones that my mother would use were about a half to three quarter inch. Those are okay. typical bone-in chuck steaks. Let's talk about how to make it, the ingredients that one would use. Maybe some variations for ingredients. I know a lot of people, whenever we make something with mushrooms, people will say, I don't like mushrooms or I'm allergic to mushrooms. What can I have that's, you know, that's something similar maybe, or yeah. what can I omit? Is there, there's wine in this dish too. Right away, you can eliminate the wine. You can eliminate the mushrooms if you want. You really could just take this dish down to tomatoes. Mm -hmm. You 100% you could do it. Do I recommend you do that? No, I don't. If you don't like mushrooms and you want some bulk in your dish still, you could increase the amount of peppers. That would be fine. Mm -hmm. Some people use potatoes in it, or a lot of people will serve the steak pizza all on top of thin roasted potatoes. Mm. So that's a really nice way to do it. And that will bulk up your dish too. You can obviously serve this with pasta. I said it in the video and said it in the recipe. Also, 
just if you want to do this, you don't need to double all the other ingredients, meaning you don't need to double the beef stock. You don't need to double the wine. Just double the can of tomatoes. Add an extra 28 ounces can of tomatoes, which 28 ounces is a standard unit can you're going to buy in America. Just add one more of those and you will have enough sauce at the end of your braise to for a pound of pasta. And many people will serve it with pasta. Mm -hmm. It's delicious that way. It's so good. Yeah. The pasta, like a penne would be great with it. Penne or even a spaghetti would be good. And then cheese on both the, your steak mm. and on your pasta. Now, I didn't talk about brighteners in the video either, and I'll just address them very quickly. So a brightener would be a gremolata. Mm -hmm. Some people would just squeeze lemon juice into it to brighten it. Mm -hmm. You already have the wine in there. So that is cutting it a little bit. That is brightening it you know, somewhat. Mm -hmm. Acids like that will will help. And it's white wine that you use. I use white wine. Plenty of people were asking if they could use mm -hmm. red wine or the better question was they were like, why are you using white wine yes. and not red wine? Yes. Use red wine. It will have, there'll be a slight difference in taste when you use a half a cup of red versus a half a cup of white, but not to the point where the dishes are going to be too different. Mm -hmm. I prefer cooking with white more. White goes in the fridge. It stores better. So I can pull it out two weeks later, use it again mm -hmm. for a dish. Red, I always, maybe it's just because reds, I normally associate more with drinking, uh, for yeah. a time, for, especially with my meal. Yeah. Like you wouldn't drink a glass of Pinot Grigio with the steak pizza. You no. would have no. a, a glass of red wine, the, the but whitest, to cook with yeah. it. Same thing. It's like bolognese traditionally uses white wine in the recipe. Is that so? Most of the time, Bolognese uses white wine. I believe the Academy, you know, uh, accepted recipe, mm -hmm. they say use white or red. Okay. Most of the time, though, if you watch a video, yeah. they'll be do like uh, an Italian in Italy, no English, they're making it with white wine. Same as with the steak pizzaiola, they're not going to sit down and have a bowl of Bolognese with white wine. They would have it with a glass of red wine to drink. Yeah, the lightest red wine I would do would be Pinot Noir. That's the one that well, I that, would use. Yeah, that's 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 the lightest. Pinot Noir for, you know, if you, if, we could do an episode on wine too if you're if you're interested, but Pinot Noir will bridge the gap between typically you would only think I can only have white wine with fish, but Pinot Noir is fine with fish. It's good. It's good with with a salmon, with I would salmon. say. I, mean, I would still opt for yeah. for like a crisp white yeah. with I mean, part, white fish. When we go out to eat and we do have wine, like if we go to like a more, a more fancy dinner and this one place we like to go to, we'll, we'll often do a white, glass of white when we're having a dish that needs the white. And then we'll switch and we'll order a glass of red for the dish that needs the red wine. It's, it's a really nice way to eat. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one of the other ingredients that you used is beef stock, Yeah. right? So I know we usually talk about the better than bouillon as being yes. a great option if you don't want to make your own beef stock. But you very recently did put out a recipe on the website yeah. for homemade beef stock. And ever since you've been using that, I've noticed a huge difference in flavor in the dishes that you've been making with the homemade stock. And it is like night and day. I mean, the food was delicious to start, but I think using the homemade stock really, really brings it to that almost restaurant. Yeah, and I would quality. I would make stocks, make make stocks, you know, off and on over the years. But I really, I, I, I almost feel like I did this more when I started with, like with YouTube and the website. I don't want to be cooking with things that you're not using because all my cooking mm -hmm. now is pretty much just making another video. So I'd be like, I want to be using the product that I'm recommending. So I have to be using the Better Than Bullion. I need everything to be the same. The, the main advantage you will have by using homemade stocks, and this is a big advantage, and you put no salt in it. It just, it's a game changer in the sense that as much reduction as you get, and you know, you, you can make anything. You can reduce, reduce much further, make a demi-glace, and then you can not worry about, you can't effectively reduce something that is even technically low sodium too much, or it will be way too salty. Mm -hmm. And then you'll be like, I have this super salty, thick sauce. Now I have to add liquid back to it. And you're completely defeating the purpose again of mm -hmm. why you reduced it. So yeah, working with homemade stocks has huge advantages. I never get when I see a recipe that has salt in it, it's that's just buy, just use better than bullion then 
the, the, you're making it so you can actually strip this. And I, w- I really wish Better Than Bullion would 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 do a no salt version of all of them. I get why they don't because salt is to make things taste better, and they're worried their product won't hold up against mm-hmm. a no salt homemade version. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's a long way of talking about the stock issue. I think we talked about all the ingredients. I mean, except for the most imp- <laughs> might be the most important two ingredients, the tomatoes and the oregano. Yeah. So what type of tomatoes would you use? And what type of oregano would you use? Well, I would say use the best tomatoes that you can find. Um, You don't need to buy San Marzano. There's really good American brands. One of the best brands is Alta Cucina. Use those. They're fabulous. The Nina cans are sold a lot of times in Costco. They're very, very cheap. If you're interested more about Costco, the, the episode prior to this, we talked all about Costco and the deals there, and you will get tremendous deals. But Use the tomatoes that you can afford that are whole tomatoes. I like to break them up, make it a little rustic. So you wouldn't use crushed tomatoes or passata or anything? I wouldn't use passata. Okay. Passata is basically used, is is almost in its finished state. So Mm -hmm. passata, you don't need to cook a long time. Yeah. Passata will just get too thick. And that is an issue even with this dish. If you have to end up braising it for a long time, you're going to evaporate most of your liquid. Mm -hmm. So you might have to add a little bit more tomato or uh, even just stock or water back into into it yeah the, it again this is all dependent on the braising time oregano yeah used sicilian oregano for this one sicilian oregano i i like to use sicilian oregano when you smell that right away it will bring you back if you if you're from new york if you left it will be one of those ingredients you will recognize when you used to walk into a pizzeria when you were young to me it's a better it's a better ingredient than most of the stuff that you buy in jars that's that's pre-ground the, the, the Sicilian oregano is this, it's the flower buds. So it's the different, you know, like when the oregano grows and it goes to seed, mm-hmm. you know, it, it grows flowers. That's, it's, it's just a spicier. So, mm-hmm. it's just, and you know, Greek oregano too, it's the same thing. Yeah. Delicious. Would you use fresh oregano? I wouldn't use fresh oregano for it. No, I okay. wouldn't. I'm not a big fan of fresh oregano. Are you? I like it in eggs, uh, not eggs held. I like fresh oregano in potato salad. And the reason why I like it is because a long time ago we made a, it was just like potato and tomato with some oil and vinegar, like olive oil and vinegar. And we had fresh oregano and we added it and it tasted so good. So I like it because of the time that I had it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, do you remember that? It sounds familiar. I feel like my grandmother would do the tomatoes with the vinegar like that with the mm-hmm. with the oregano. Yeah. 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 It was very fresh tasting. Okay. So as far as the method of, of you cooking yeah. it, do you want to talk about that? So method, th- watch the video for the braising method. Honestly, you can do it the way I did it. You can also just do it in a Dutch oven with the lid covered. Mm-hmm. Totally fine. You could put it in the oven. There were many questions about that. People were like, oh God, I don't want to do it in the pan there on the burner that long. Put it in the Dutch, put it in your Dutch oven, cover it, cook it until it's tender. So, you know, I can tell you cook your chuck until it's 205 degrees Fahrenheit, where the connective tissue, everything is breaking down, where a lot of your fat is liquefying. Ultimately, you really just want it to be nice and fork tender when when you grab it. That's it's in kind of an easier way for for me to tell you what to mm-hmm. do. Because when they get really thin, it's hard to take an accurate temperature measurement in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's best to just what like use a fork and just break it and see if it's yeah, just like how like it's in, good. And we've done so many beef dishes recently yeah. where I'm always breaking it apart. They're all kind of blending together. In my <laughs> They're all mind. blending together. It's the beef bourguignon and the and the steak pizza all were back to back. Those videos, you know, talking about the flash way. Flash way would be extremely thin piece of beef, and a lot of times this beef is just top round, bottom round. It'll be stuff that has no fat in it and you will just sear that minute hot pan minute per side take it out make your sauce put the beef back in cook it for a minute or two and Mm -hmm. you're done so you could do steak pie steak pizza all in a few minutes that way so it could be like a weeknight yeah 30 minute it's a completely different dish that way i prefer the long way Mm -hmm. but i don't want to neglect the short way that most of the recipes on page one of google will be for the short way because short quick timing things always win. So people are like, oh God, I'm not doing this sip and feast guy's recipe. It's two, two and a half hours. And Mm -hmm. versus this person says it takes 22 minutes to make steak pizzaiola. So that, that affects a lot of click. That's true. Yeah. 
So, but they're and they're just entirely different dishes. I, w- I would like to put the recipe up for both of them. Uh, another way to do it, which is a very quick way, would be to use a flank steak. So, with the flank steak, you would cut it. If you when you look at a flank steak, a typical flank steak is about one and a half to two pounds. You buy the whole flank in a store. The, a flank steak is an easy cut for a beginner to use because the grain is so visible the way it goes. It'll just be lines running, you know, running the length of it. It's okay. It, it'll just be lines running the length of it. And what you can do is you can cut two inch long strips following that grain, then turn it the other way and then cro- then cut perpendicular to that grain. Okay. So a 90 degree cut. And then that's going to make the pieces nice and easy for you to tear them. You always want to cut against the grain to make a more tender cut. You can take all that beef, you can sear it in the pan, like flash sear it, remove it, make your sauce, throw the steak back in, and then you have very quick tender. Like it's not tender, it's chewy, but good, Mm -hmm. which is the way, what dish that we just did with that. The steak stroganoff or beef stroganoff. Beef stroganoff. And that's coming up. Probably so, shortly after you uh, listen to this. And if you need help visualizing, I think the way you were describing how to cut, you you show how yes. to cut it in that video. Yes, show so, the video and on the site yeah, how to do so, it. So somebody who who's listening who wants to do uh, the flank steak for the steak pizza, although they could watch how you prepared yes. the flank steak in the stroganoff video yeah. and then kind of just apply it to the pizza. Yeah. And I like the flank steak idea because flank is about half the price of skirt steak. And, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a good value. It's actually a good value at Costco. They normally have a good price on it. So it's not a cheap cut. Chuck and Flank are kind of similar prices now, which is, again, very odd. I mean, the reason my mother used Chuck when, when we were young is because she was able to buy those steaks for like $1.49 a pound or whatever. And Jeez. it was just like, I don't, maybe less. It was, it was a super cheap peasant dish. Mm-hmm. Peasant dish for people here in in uh, Italy, it would still be too expensive for some somebody to cook. Mm-hmm. But that was like, we've went, gone into stuff like that in the past. So that's essentially the dish. I mean, you can finish it with nice basil, a little parsley. I didn't talk about variations on it. Did, so We'll go, yeah. Oh, we're gonna go into that. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna go into that right now then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What would you think would be a great variation? Because I think you know the answer to some, some, of, these, some of these ideas. Because I think I've made it a couple times in the Chicken. past. Right? Oh, well, I wasn't even, I was talking about if we're still staying with steak, like okay. what other ingredients would you add to it? Oh. Think, what would you, just think about, even if you don't know like what what I was thinking, just what would you like in it that would totally change the character of the dish, but still be delicious? Do you have something that I'm supposed to say? Cherry peppers for sure. I think the mushrooms are the best way to make it because we Well, you do mushrooms and cherry peppers. You could. Yeah, I think cherry. Pe- yeah, I think cherry peppers is gonna really change the dish. It's gonna make it more like an arrabbiata. Or but it's, it, it, I would use the cherry peppers over the Calabrian chilies. I wouldn't use them. The Calabrian chilies is gonna make it too spicy. I don't think I would use either. I think for me, I think this dish is meant to not be a spicy dish. Okay, so then we're, then we'll talk but about that's other. Me. Let's talk about other ingredients. Then what else do you have? We just there's a couple ingredients we talked about in the Costco episode. Um, I've made it. I made it a couple times with this. Have you? Yeah, but I did it with the thin steaks, like the thin top round pieces. I did. Am I supposed to remember this? It is capers, okay, okay. and the oil oh. cured olives. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be good. Yeah, but then you're like going into just a touch, not Putinesca too much territory. Not, not not too much, just a touch. Yeah. You know? No, I think that would be really good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I could have it without the peppers and just the mushrooms. Yeah. But I do like the peppers in it. All right. Well, those are the variations. And then as far as the variations on the dish, you could do pork chop pizzaiola. Delicious. You can do chicken pizzaiola. We have a recipe for the chicken pizzaiola. It's very much the same uh, with the still with the mushrooms and the peppers. I think I put onions in it too. If you were going to do pork chop, you would like pork pizzaiola, you would use pork chops, like bone in pork yeah. chops? So if you, you, if you use loin chops, which mm-hmm. are the best type of chops you can use, those ones I would do a nice sear, pull them out, I would make my sauce and then just spoon it over, like kind of the fancy steak way. Mm-hmm. If you're using a low quality chop, which are, I forget, the, they're um, blade chops. If you're using something like that, uh, in, they're a lot cheaper in the supermarket than, than the better quality pork chops. Those ones actually work well, fairly well by 
long braising them. So, you know, the pork will be cooked all the way past, but there's enough fat and connective tissue, grizzle, whatever in there that it will work. I actually cooked the pork chops and cherry peppers or pork chops and vinegar peppers in that manner mm, in the bra- yes. slow braise. Those are good too. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, high quality beef or pork, short, the, you know, braising stuff, long cook. What about for our vegetarian listeners? Could you do like a giant portobello mushroom pizzaiola? You could. I mean, I, I almost feel like we're, you know, we're including it at the end, but I, I kind of feel that vegetarians are probably mostly would skip this type of dish. But yeah, I mean, that would be, that would be what I would do. Mm-hmm. That would be really the only ingredient I could think of for yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, we, we have like a lot of vegetarian dishes that are just tomato based. Like we have the, uh, butternut squash parmesan. So mm-hmm. I almost feel like you're better off doing like a parmesan instead of just a pizzaiola. Yeah. So I would add some like mozzarella and kind mm-hmm. of layer it, you know, if you were going to use that uh, portobello. Yeah. And then you mentioned it before, but you do have the recipe for the sausage stuffed yes. mushrooms with a pizzaiola sauce. If you wanted to make those, you could skip the sausage and just make regular stuffed mushrooms with a pizzaiola sauce? You can. I feel like it, the meat, the hearty meat of the mushrooms balances it out a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty sure my grandmother used to make a dish like this. She used to stuff the mushrooms with meat and then it was like tomatoes she would like squeeze on top of it. Yeah. So it's just um, the way I did it. I don't know if she used sausage for it. I think it might have been ground beef. I can't, mm-hmm. It. I think it's better with sausage though. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what I would recommend. Yeah, those yeah. are really good. That's a, That video has not been put out <laughs> yet. I think that was like the last video we filmed in the yeah. old- Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's like a year ago now. Kitchen. We have like seven videos that have been filmed like six, nine months ago that have never made it. They're like the Sip and Feast lost lost files. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if I'm gonna, where I'm gonna put them. I might put them on Patreon, like secret episodes, or I, I'm not sure. I feel like I can't put- video up of the old kitchen now it's going to confuse people yeah. <laughs> we have the old kitchen the old kitchen is not gone it's it's still our kitchen it's if you follow our instagram and you should you'll see it i i show the i show that kitchen all the time mm-hmm. feel free to message us you can message us through podcast at sip and or you can leave a comment on the youtube video to let us know maybe there's a different way you make it i think we kind of covered all the bases here with this dish and you know, obviously there's some some more obscure ways that, that we didn't, but we really tried to be thorough in the sense that give you a pretty good head start on making this one, I mm-hmm. think, right? Yeah, I, th- I hope. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if I sold it effectively if you really want to make it. Tara, maybe sell it for 20 seconds. Should people make it? Definitely. They should make it because it's, you're using more inexpensive cuts of beef. So you're going to get that great beefy, <laughs> you're going to get that great <laughs> beefy flavor for less money. I think it's a really tasty dish. And I I do agree with you. I was kind of playing devil's advocate with, you know, making it in the summer, but I would agree that it's like a fall and winter dish. And if I walked home, like walked in through the door on a weeknight and and smelled that cooking, um, I would be really excited to eat it because that's the other thing I don't think we talked about, the the smell of the food. The way it makes your home smell is just yeah. Well, I think we're a few years away. Like it. We're a few years away from smell a vision on, yeah. on the YouTube videos. All right, we're gonna go into the questions. First question is from Cheston. Jim and Tara, I recently watched your pasta ichechi video from seven months back. In the beginning, when introducing the aromatics, you said something about using the Parmigiano Reggiano rind for over eighty recipes. Did you mean? that you use the same rind in all those recipes <laughs> or that you just use a rind in each dish. I use a cheese rind in lots of soups I make, but I always throw it away after cooking uh-huh, that yeah. meal. Okay. So yeah. answer that because that's, I know. we've gotten asked that question many, many times. You know what? I have to really be more precise, I think, with the language I use. So Cheston, I meant I've used it in probably 80 dishes and it's probably not that many, but pretty much... A lot of soups I've made and a lot of dishes that kind of straddle that soup or pasta line like pasta e chechi, I will add it in. I just, I always like to let people know about this because, you know, you're buying the rind. I mean, you're buying the cheese, the block of cheese, and you have the rind. And I think instinctually, most people will throw want to throw it away when mm-hmm. they're done with it. They'll like get that last bit and they don't realize that 
you can use it and you can actually, in fact, eat the whole rind. Yeah, but you're th- you're using the rind for one dish. One dish. I just and use then it one you're time. throwing it away just yeah. to because that's the question. Yeah. Is are you reusing it? Hundred percent. You're you're throwing it away. You're throwing it yeah, away. Yeah. I mean, you're hundred percent throwing it away. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely throwing it away. <laughs> I but think you you're can, making the, you're making this even more confusing. I'm I'm sorry for the confusion. <laughs> I'm being a moron today. Um, no, throw it away. Yeah. Now, definitely throw it away. But you can also eat it before you throw it away. Yeah, the, yeah after you after you let it simmer in your soup or whatever. Yeah. The other thing I want to add is that you're not like, so if you have the rind from like, a, let's just use Costco size Parmigiano Reggiano as an example. It's usually what, like four inches, four to five inches by two inches. Yes. Right. Yeah. So you're not using that entire rind. No, no. So you can take that rind, you can cut it into slices. You really only need like a maybe one inch. Yeah, no, you could probably get five to five to ten blo- uh, yes. rinds in a Costco size block. Yes. So do that. Don't just use one rind, like one giant rind for one dish so that you can get more mileage out of it. The other thing I wanted to mention is that I, I've seen it sold at Uncle Giuseppe's and Whole Foods where they will actually package the rinds in like a plastic container and you can buy yeah. them that way. And, you know, it's, I, I don't even know what it costs, maybe like $2.50 or whatever, depending on the weight. Um, but if you want, like if there's a cheesemonger at the grocery store and you don't see the rinds out, I would recommend asking the cheesemonger if they have rinds that they can sell to you. And honestly, they might not even sell them to you. They might just give them to you and say, oh, we were going to get rid of them anyway. She's right. And uh, honestly, I think they only started selling them now at Whole Foods is partly from because of my videos and a few <laughs> other people. I'm not kidding. I, I'm really not because I'll tell you what, a lot of the other guys and girls on YouTube, they don't use them like I do. I I know this because everybody's like, Jim, you're the only person I've seen do this. I think some of them are copying me now in their videos, but I've been doing it for for the whole four years that I've been making videos. And it's like miraculously, then I I remember starting to see them in Whole Foods like a year ago. Mm-hmm. And I think Whole Foods was charging, it's crazy to say this, I think close to the price per pound that Costco ch- charges for their blocks of cheese, right? I want to say Whole Foods was charging nine bucks a pound for these rinds, and you can buy the whole block of cheese at Costco for ten ninety nine mm-hmm. a pound. Yeah. I don't know what Uncle Giuseppe's charges for. It's a good place. I recommend, I tell you guys that we get a lot of ingredients there. There's so many things at that store just rubs me the wrong way. Their basil is horrible. And and a lot of their produce, right? Uh, Tara, am I wrong, right or wrong here? A lot of times I, if I go there, I have to go to other stores for their basil. Their parsley is not always good. It's, it's, it's hit or miss, but it's honestly, it's like that in almost every place that I go to, which is why I'm usually going to three different grocery stores. That's not even including Costco. But Uncle Giuseppe's, you are trying to sell Italian ingredients. That's your thing. Why are you not selling high quality basil? Your competitors have basil in it. I mean, they do. It's just, I don't want to buy the basil from Brazil that you keep selling in the supermarket. That's where it's from. It's, is it? It's not good. It's like, uh, I don't know what variety it is either, but it's not the variety. I, I, I mean, it's it's a pain because then we're like stuck in a situation where we need the basil. We're going to actually end up growing our basil indoors this year mm-hmm. for this particular reason. Yeah. That being said, you know, if I need certain ingredients like, uh, what's the, for the cannoli? Yeah. Impastata. Yeah. Like they'll have that. They'll have uh, they'll guanciale. Have the, yeah. They have the granicata. Granicotto. Granicotto for uh, for the pie, the Easter pie. Yeah, they you have can't all find that anywhere else. Stuff that you, you just, it's almost like you have you have to go there, but this is like almost like, you know, they're, they're going to probably hate me for saying this. You want to own that market. Like, why don't you own it with good quality produce and basil? You know, I mean, I get like some things might be bad, but it's like basil's a really important ingredient. The only basil, because Meat Farm's basil uh, Meat Farms has great produce, but their basil is usually not good either. The only good basil in the store is at Whole Foods. They have Gotham Greens, which is, I think it's good because it's it's grown in Brooklyn. So it's not sitting on a truck forever. It is good, but I'll tell you that one too. The second you open it, it deflates. Yeah. 
I mean, maybe yeah. I'm asking for too much here. You maybe, are. Maybe, You're, maybe, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, maybe, maybe I am. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the next question. Let's move on. This question comes from Chris. I see in a lot of your videos recommendations for fresh herbs and spices. Out here in the sticks of Texas, getting those fresh in a store is difficult, and I just don't have room to grow them. Is there a place for the dried stuff? Are there dried spices that simply must be avoided? Well, Chris, yeah, we're going to continue the herb conversation here. That first question wasn't even about bait about it but then so this is a, this is a good a, you didn't even know i was asking this, this is a question. great transition so a natural here. segue <laughs> um yeah no the basil so maybe you have enough room to grow a little bit indoors that's what we're going to do this year i'll just tell you and i've i've said this in other in i've said this plenty of times now dried basil is is not a good ingredient it in my opinion it's a downright horrible ingredient in my opinion if you're following a website that uses a lot of it i wouldn't recommend any of the recipes because people who know and they know y- y- this is this is the this is the easiest way for me to describe this. There will never be a person ever who will use dried basil when fresh basil is around. Do you, do you agree with that, Tara? Yeah, and I don't even think f- dried basil is a substitute. It's not for fresh basil. It changes into a completely licoricey, disgusting, uh, p- overly potent mess that has doesn't resemble at all what it what it once was oregano on the other hand actually gets better when it's dried so gets more potent in a good way mm-hmm. time is another one time is great fresh it's great dried rosemary great fresh mm-hmm. excellent dried mm-hmm. basil big no no what about parsley so parsley is Fine to use dry. It has no taste. It looks, it's green sawdust. <laughs> but it's not going to ruin your food. Yeah. Ba- dried basil will ruin your food. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we use a lot of fresh herbs on the channel, and it's partly, there, there is, you can store your your parsley, though. So say you want to buy a bunch and you don't use it, and you're like, I'm just wasting it every week. My mother, my grandmother would always portion that into like little foil packets and stick them always in like the side of the freezer Mm -hmm. and then pull that out, chop their parsley. Basil, you could kind of do it with. It's It does change the flavor a little bit. Dried basil and the thing called Italian seasoning has no practical use in Italian or Italian American food. If you see somebody using it, and I I, I, I don't like to be a hater, but this this in this instance, I got to tell you, I, I would question every single recipe the person has if they're using that. Am I being too drastic about this here? Am I being too whatever? I I don't I don't think I am. I do not enjoy Italian seasoning. I think it ruins dishes. Um, that's my personal opinion. That's not influenced by you. I've tried using it. I think back in the day when I used to follow recipes, and it's not good. So now when I see that somebody is using two tablespoons worth of Italian seasoning to make their marinara sauce, it is mind boggling to me. I'm like, marinara is supposed to be like a fresh tomato sauce. And- yeah. It's just, dis- it's disgusting. <laughs> and then, you know, we get these, que- I, I get these comments now, like beef bourguignon is on, is, is going kind of like viral on, on, on the channel. It's got four, over 400,000 views in seven days. And, this might go on to be like a five million view video. I, I'm getting I'm getting the morons in the comment sections now. They're like they're, they're like today I had to hide like or I had to block like five people. They're like they're like why does this why they're like they call me a moron. They're like why does this moron <laughs> think that he can get away with putting no seasoning in this dish and it's going to be good? These people and I'm talking to you if you're listening right now who who was they're, writing that they're not listening. <laughs> they they sometimes do. They are watching these people that are dumping spices on food with black gloves, those bro gloves. You watch those people at your own peril. Everything will be horrible if you follow them. You do not need to use half of your spice cabinet every time you cook a dish. How much money are you spending on spices? (laughs) It's absurd. And then don't even get me started. You know, I know I get criticized for using too much salt. The amount of salt that I see people putting on stuff. So, so yeah, again, ultimately, 
do what you want, but if you want, if you really want to take one word of advice, I say, don't use dried basil or Italian seasoning. I think you should get a t-shirt that says don't use dried basil. Yeah, I'm going to get like a mug, yeah. like a merch mug. Yeah. Like, or like, like, say no to dried basil. Or it'll it'll be like one of those, the signs, like the no smoking sign with the, the line through it. You'll have like dried basil. <laughs> right up there. Yeah. <laughs> we have nothing up there yet. <laughs> You've entered the no dried basil zone. <laughs> The no dry basil zone. Oh my God. We're really dating ourselves now. He, he got canceled like 10 years ago. All right. This is from Pam. I'm curious if there are any go to cookbooks you use for your recipes and do you have a recipe for rainbow cookies? So, two part question. And I know Pam asked specifically about cookbooks. Do you want to throw in a, a website? So, the gentleman I spoke about earlier, that tower read the quote from him. That's Frank Ferriello. I really trust his recipes. I trust his site. I trust his knowledge. I, I don't I don't really go to his site for the recipes per se. I go there to know the backstory of the dish, which I think he does really well. Uh, that being said, I'm sure his recipes are, I'm sure they're perfect because I look at them. You know, you're not going to find Frank Ferriello using dried basil and Italian seasoning in his, any of his recipes. Period. I'm going out on a limb here and saying that, and I haven't looked at his recipes, but there's no way that he's going to be using that. And that go, that's ditto for a lot of other people. I heard that one of the best recipe uh, authors is Harold McGee. Okay, that one. It's like a Bible on how to cook everything in very much in a scientific way, but mm -hmm. basically it will get you through everything. Like you'll learn supposedly everything in there that you would learn in culinary school. But you haven't used it personally. Do I have Do you have any cookbooks that you reference? What about Marcella Hazan? Marcella Hazan, I don't have, I, uh, do we have any of her cookbooks? Angie, Angie, let, Angie let, let us borrow yeah. a couple. I don't really like to look at recipe books per se. I like to, I'll get a general sense of how something's done. Then I'll try to find like a little bit more of the history of the dish. And then I try to make my attempt at it. I'm never really trying to make anything 100% authentic. So I don't really have to do research in that manner to, I, I have to do more research to talk, to do a set, do a show like we did today. Mm -hmm. Because I'm always trying to make things authentic to how they are here in New York. So, and really trying to fulfill that experience if you grew up in a similar situation that I did, pr predominantly in this part, this pocket of America. But, you know, that's that's it. I respect all these, all these authors and the amount of time and effort it takes to make a cookbook. We might really be in the process of doing that now. And it's it's a it's a monumental undertaking to mm -hmm. do it. Let's go on and answer Pam's second part of the question, which is, do we have a recipe for rainbow cookies? Which I think was interesting because we were just talking about doing a rainbow cookie recipe yesterday with, with yeah. Sammy, our daughter, who does some recipe testing for us on the desserts because she loves baking. Um, we don't have the rainbow cookie recipe yet. We would like to get one out. I don't know if it's going to be this year though, because it's like in yeah. time for Christmas. It's a, it's a very involved process. It's a tough thing, Pam, because we're doing all these fall ones now, and that when that ends, then we have limited time to get the recipes, those last bit of cookies we want before Christmas time. I I, I really want to put it up, like Tara was saying, but. Um, I don't know if we're going to get to it. Mm -hmm. I, I can't make any promises. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for now, we have, I think, a decent amount yeah. of the Christmas cookies, Italian cookies. Like, we have the Cucciadotti. We have the Reginelle. We have Pignoli. Yeah, there's a lot. So yeah. we have a lot of them. Yeah. But I I love rainbow cookies. I would love to put yeah. a recipe up. It actually doesn't sound that hard. I don't think it's that hard. It just is time-consuming. But so to... It's one thing to make them, right? Yeah. But it's another for when when we put up a recipe, we're test we usually test it, right? Yeah. At least once before we photograph it. But there's also the whole photographing process that's involved. So yeah. like for example, probably the most difficult dessert recipe we've done was cannoli. Cannoli by far. That was a beast. By far. We we spoke I think I believe we spoke about it in previous episodes. I don't know how many people made it. You mm -hmm. know, <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah. I actually I pro probably more people would make a rainbow cookie. I, probably. Yeah. I, you yeah. know what, Pam? I think we're gonna do it. I, I don't hold me to it, but I think we're gonna do it. I think we have to. It's just I don't know if if we'll have it out by this Christmas. Yeah. 
Anyway, that's it for today. Podcast at sipandfeast.com. Leave us your questions. We'll see you next week.